tell the chorus that he cannot be held down, uh, that he cannot, uh, he cannot be chained up. Um, it, of course, we think about uh, Prometheus bound when we hear something like this, right? He says, I had no pain. He says, I had no peril when they were tying me up and taking me to the stable where they took him. Twas mine own hand, he says, set me free. And the, the chorus will say, well, yeah, but I thought you were like all tied up. And um, uh, Dionysius will say, no, 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 I put Pentheus, I put Pentheus in, a, uh, in, a, in a spell, under a spell, and he actually was tying up a bull in the stable, he thought he was tying up me. Then Dionysius says, I burned down the entire stable, right? And um, uh, Pentheus, he said, I made him chase me around until he got so tired with his little sword that he finally fell down exhausted. We think about Puck, of course, forcing Lysander and Demeter to run through the woods in Midsummer Night's Dream, right? Calling them, calling them, and they finally get so exhausted they go to sleep, right? Again, just to remind, in the very beginning of this play, Dionysius is a god of peace. At the end of this play, he's anything but a god of violence and retribution and vengeance. Um, just to finish this one, um, Dionysius says it this way, I will endure um, Pentheus gently, though he come in fury hot, for still are the ways of wisdom, and her temper trembleth not. In other words, I'm going to go ahead and try to convince Pentheus the gentle way that he should engage in worship of the god Dionysius. If he doesn't do that, well, um, then uh, Pentheus comes in. He is really, really upset. And, um, and he will say, it's too much, he says. This eastern knave hath slipped his prison, whom I held, but now hard gripped in bondage. Ha! Tis he! Right? Um, and, uh, and Pentheus asks him, how did you get here? How did you break your cage? Speak! Now, of course, audience members will say, uh, you tied him up, he got away. You tied up all his women, they got away. The earthquakes, the fires... Don't you think it's probably time that you start to recognize that maybe what you're dealing with here is somebody who's got some special abilities? Pentheus is having absolutely none of it. Uh, Dionysius said, said I not, or didst thou mark me or hear me not, that, that there was one living that should set me free? I told you you couldn't contain me. Who, Pentheus asks, ever wilder are these tales of thine? Dionysius says, he who first made for man the clustered vine. Pentheus says, I scorn him and his vines. Dionysius says, for Dionysius, tis well, for in thy scorn his glory lies. In other words, as you're making fun of Dionysius, his glory will be made clear, manifest. And then Pentheus says to his guard, go swift to all the towers and bar with all each gate. And Dionysius asks, what? Cannot God or leap a wall? And it's at this point then that you have, uh, you have uh, this uh, messenger who arrives uh, from the mountain who begins to report what he saw there. Now, this is significant, so put this in your notes. This is a play about theater. Think of it. I'm, I'm a Greek person in 405. I walk into the theater, I sit down. It occurs to me during this discussion of what the messenger saw that what I am actually doing is, in fact, seeing. But there's different ways of seeing. For example, the messenger is going to explain stuff that he saw, and in our mind's eye, we are definitely, when we hear the description, we are definitely going to see the crazy stuff that this messenger is going to tell Pentheus, right? That is to say, theater is a way of seeing. Right? It's a way that we see, and of course, this is exactly what Aristotle said in his classic poetics, that the real drama doesn't happen on stage. The real drama that's occurring is out there in the audience. You'll remember in our conversations we said this, right? Well, the messenger, he, first he asks, he says, hey, uh, are you, are you, do you really want me to tell you what I saw? Because I know you're a guy that gets really upset, and I don't want you to jack me. And Pentheus says, no, no, I really want you to tell me what it is that you saw. Well, on um, Scytheron, this mountain, okay, all kinds of crazy stuff going on. The, the messenger says, I saw three groups of women. One of them was led by Agave, your mom, right, who was in fact doing all kinds of things. The, uh, she, she there beneath the trees, 
Sleeping they lay like wild things flung at ease in the forest, where the wild things are, right? One half sinking on a bed of deep pine greenery. They're all there sleeping naked. Um, they got, they're, they're, some of them are breastfeeding baby animals. They're able to produce water from rock. We think of the Exodus 17 story in the Bible. Wine from sticks that are stuck into the ground. We think, of course, of Christ and the wedding a celebration in John 2 of, in Cana, right? Um, and when they, uh, the messenger said, when we went up to try to capture Agave, because that's what you, Pentheus, that's what you told us, King Pentheus, you told us to do this. When we got, then all of a sudden, they went nuts, absolutely nuts. Now, in the Greek, we got two concepts here. Sparkmos, which is um, the tearing of live animals apart. And omophagia, which is the eating of the animal raw. Okay. Now, while we don't have a lot of the omophagia uh, in this, we know that the Bacchilian Dionysian rites did some of both. For those of you who are following, of course, your Christian analog of the Christian mass, then obviously it goes without saying, right? But what we're told next, they, they chase down cows and they tear up these cows. They eat these cows. The flesh was upon the branches and red rain from the deep green pines, right? The bulls of pride, horns swift to rage, were fronted and aside, flung stumbling by these multitudinous hands, dragged pitilessly. Now, of course, we're getting set up for what's going to happen at the end of this play. But the messenger says, no, you don't understand. These women, when they went nuts, they went nuts. They tore the cows apart just destroyed them. There even seems to be some suggestion maybe of omophagia, that, that eating of the, of the cows as well and all of that. Um, and, uh, and, and then uh, the next thing they did, they ran down to the village. They caught up little children from their homes, high on their shoulders, babes unheld that swayed and laughed and fell not. All a wreck they made, yea, bronze and iron did shatter and in place struck hither and thither, yet no wound had they. Caught up fire from out the hearts, yea, carried hot flames in their hair and were scorched not. I mean, we think about snake handlers in certain kinds of Christian religious traditions that can do all kinds of crazy stuff. Here, they can even pick up fire and put it on their head, and nothing happens to them at all, right? As he's telling, as he's telling this, uh, this story, you can imagine, Pentheus is like, this guy is, you got, he's got to be making this up. Then we're told that uh, the holy women, back to those strange um, um, well, the messenger says, interjects, sure some God was in these things. In other words, this is not normal behavior at all. And then he says, and the holy women back to those strange springs returned that God had sent them when the day dawned on the upper heights and washed away the stain of battle. So in other words, they're covered in blood and guts and so they go back to the mountain streams and those girdling snakes that were in their hair hissed out to lap the water drops and blood from cheeks and hair and breast. Wow. So in other words, this is some strange stuff that, uh, that, that's going on here. And then the messenger says, Therefore I counsel thee to the king, receive this spirit, whoe'er he be, to Thebes in glory. Greatness manifold is all about him. And the tale is told that this is he who first demanded give the grief assuaging vine. Why? Oh, let him live, for if he die, then love herself is slain, and nothing joyous in the world again. In other words, you, you probably should let this guy go, because he, oh, we're told, this Dionysian God, he gave us wine, which makes love all the more important and possible. Right? The leader of the chorus will say, I tremble, and scarce may speak my thought to a king's face, yet will I hide it not, Dionysius is God, no God, more true, nor higher. In other words, he clearly is God and the son of a God. Wow, you better, you better listen. Pentheus is having none of it. He says, it bursts hard on us like a smothered fire, this frenzy of Bacchic women. All my land is made their mock. This needs an iron hand. And then he calls to his captain of the guard. He says, we march to war. Shall women dare such deeds against us? 
sounding very much like Creon in Sophocles' Antigone. We cannot let these women run the show. Enough. Now let's put it in our notes. Pentheus is a pathetic character because he's doing the very thing he's supposed to do, ordained by the gods to keep law and order. But at the same time, Pentheus is pretty stubborn here. I mean, he's got a lot of evidences that he should be paying attention to, that something clearly is in fact going on. He's gotten counsel from Tiresias. He's gotten counsels from Cadmus. He's gotten counsels here, obviously, from the leader of the chorus. You should probably let this thing go, and you should probably show some reverence to the gods. He's having none of it. Pentheus is ready to go to war. It's Dionysius who will say it's better to yield to the God in prayer and sacrifice than kick against the pricks, since Dionysius is God and thou art but mortal. We, we think, of course, of that Acts 26, 14 line about Paul, God speaking to Paul, why do you kick against the pricks, right? right? Dionysius will say to, to Pentheus then, I think it makes sense that you probably should knock this off and not be so... And, and Pentheus will... It will come back. In fact, he will say, well or ill, I must entreat this God. He must babble still this, this, this person. The word babble here is, in fact, where we get that word barbarian in the Greek. In other words, Pentheus continues to see this messenger of Dionysius, actually Dionysius, he just doesn't know that, as an outsider, as the foreign, as someone not to be listened to, right? Um, um, and, and then it will be Dionysius who will make the most interesting suggestion. He says, hey, these women on the mountain, I can lead them to you if you want me to. Pentheus is like, no, 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 no. I know, I'm not letting you out of my sight. And it's at this moment the key line of the play will happen. And it will in fact be Dionysius who will say, hey, would you like to see them? The Baca, the Minas the women on the mountain doing crazy. Would you like to see them? What are your thoughts about that? And um, Dionysius will say, yeah, yeah, I would like to see them. Though it cost me all the gold of Thebes, all of a sudden he says, I would like to see this. Now, of course, we're going to talk in a moment about why this is so significant to our understanding of theater as the power of sight and seeing. Dionysius says, so much? You're ready to give me all the gold of Thebes? Thou art quick to fall to such great longing. The word fall, of course, will immediately make us think about Milton's Paradise Lost, won't it, right? And the whole notion of temptation and the eating of the forbidden fruit and all of that. Do you think Milton knew this play at all? Oh, yeah. Along with Shakespeare, of course, right? Uh, of the age of the Renaissance and beyond. Pentheus is a little bit bewildered and he says, it would grieve me much to see them flown with wine. Yet, Dionysius says, you want to see it? Even though it would grieve you? And Pentheus says, yes, I fain would watch ambushed among the pines. There's all kinds of irony because we know what's about to happen here in a few moments off stage, but what's about to happen to Pentheus. Dionysius says, it would be vain to hide they soon would track you down. Pentheus says, oh yeah, t'were best done openly. I should just go out there in the open and watch them. Wilt thou be led by me? Dionysius asks, and try the venture? Pentheus says, indeed I will. Lead on. Why should we wait? Now this notion of lead me on is fascinating. Now, it's hard to read uh, uh, out of the Greek exactly what we think is going on here. It's clear that Pentheus is kind of under a spell. But what kind of spell? And is it just Dionysius recognizes that sooner or later with some of the crazy stories that Pentheus has been hearing, he wants to see for himself the craziness that's going on with women out on the mountain and all of that, right? Dionysius, though, says, first, before we go, we need a rich and trailing robe of fine linen to gird thee. In other words... Before we can go to the show, we have to put on our costumes. Mm. This, of course, is even more palpable for Greek audiences because there they are looking, of course, with those masks as the primary form of the personae, right? Pentheus says, Nay, am I a woman then and no man here? In other words, I'm not dressing up like a woman. Dionysius says, Wouldst have them slay thee dead? No man may see their mysteries. You're not allowed, if you're a man, to see. You have to dress up like a woman 
to be able to have any chance to see them. Pentheus says, I am, well said. I marked thy subtle temper ere long now. In other words, oh yeah, you're a smart guy. Dionysius says, tis Dionysius that prompted me. Pentheus says, and how meanest thou the further plan? Dionysius says, first, take thy way within, and I will array thee. So let's go inside, if you will, to the tiring house in English, the Elizabethan phrase, theater, and they, the, the dressing room. In other words, we gotta go in the dressing room. We gotta, we, we gotta get our costume on, right? Um, what array? The woman's? Again, Pentheus says, I will not. Dionysus says, does it change so soon? All thy desire to see this strange adorning? Wait, Pentheus says, what garb wilt thou bestow about me? Dionysus says, well, first, you got to have the hair. A wig dangling low beneath thy shoulders. Note the irony, it was just a few moments ago on stage that Pentheus cut off the hair of Dionysus. And now Pentheus himself will put the hair of the Dionysian on, right? Pentheus says, okay, what's, what's next? Dionysus said, well, you got to have the robe falling to the feet. And on thy head, you got to have the hood, the, the wreath. And after, hast thou aught beyond? Surely, he says, the dappled fawn skin and the wand, the very things that, uh, the very fawn skin that Tiresias was wearing. Pentheus is struggling with himself, but he says, enough. I cannot wear a robe or a hood and the, and, and the, uh, and, and the, and the, the garland. Um, uh, Dionysus says, Would you rather draw the sword and spill men's blood? True, he says. Pentheus now says, Yeah, that were evil. Aye, tis best to go first to some place of watch. In other words, all of a sudden, it's interesting, the pacifist, many have argued that Euripides is a great pacifist. The pacifist, Euripides, is saying, You don't want to go and kill them. You want to go and watch them. You want to see them in the wild, right? Doing the crazy things they do. Dionysus says, far wiser so, then seek by wrath's, wrath's bitter recompense. In other words, he who uses the sword dies by the sword. This will be, of course, foreshadowing of what's about to happen, right? Pentheus will say, what are the city streets? Canst lead me hence unseen of any? In other words, I'm going to be walking through the city streets. What about, are people going to, are people going to see me? Dionysus says, lonely and untried thy path from hence shall be, and I... Thy guide, don't worry, you're going on a little odyssey. It's going to be a fascinating little trip that you're about to take. Pentheus says, I care for nothing, so these bacchanals triumph not against me. In other words, the only thing I want is to subdue these women. I'll do anything to do that. Forward to my halls within, I will ordain what seemeth best. In other words, I'll follow you. Dionysius says, so be it, O king, tis mine to obey thine hest, whate'er it be. In other words, your wish is my command. Pentheus hesitating once more and waiting, says, well, I will go. Perchance to march and scatter them with serried lance. Perchance to take thy plan. I know not yet. In other words, Pentheus is still a little bit split still between am I going to go there with my sword and kill all these women or am I going to go there and just watch? And then he will leave. Leaving Dionysius on stage, speaking the disturbing lines. Denzel's, the lion walketh to the net. Now this is significant because the damsels are the women on the mountain. He will reference Pentheus as a lion. That will be significant for what's coming at the end of the play. And walking into the net, we think of Clytemnestra, of course, and her comments about how she caught Agamemnon upon his return in Aeschylus' first of the Oresteia trilogy. He finds his Bacchae now and sees and dies and pays for all his sin. In other words, Dionysius says, what we are about to witness is the justice, the vengeance of a god on Pentheus for his disbelief. Oh, Dionysius, this is thine honor, and thou not far away. Grant us our vengeance. First, O master, stay the course of reason in him and instill a foam of madness. Let his seeing will, which ne'er had stooped to put thy vesture on, be darkened till the deed is lightly done. Grant likewise that he find through all his streets loud scorn. This man of wrath and bitter threats that made Thebes tremble led in woman's guise. It's going to be awesome because he's going to be mad crazy. He's not going to realize everybody will be looking at him, laughing at him. In other words, Dionysius will humiliate Pentheus before he makes sure Pentheus is killed.
I go to fold that robe of sacrifice on Pentheus that shall deck him to the dark, his mother's gift. So shall he learn and mark God's true son, Dionysi, in fullness God, most fearful, yet to man, most soft of mood. In these final lines, Euripides will have the god Dionysius say, I can be brutal, I can be vengeful, I can also be kind and gentle and sweet. It all depends on you and how you respond to me. Well, I mean, let's just think about the significance of this line. Notice this is the shift, right? In Pentheus, from the hater to the follower, from hater to watcher, that is to say, the theater. Remember, we are watching epiphanies as they unfold on stage. Remember what Aristotle said, again, in Poetics. The power of the theater, he said, in his classic essay on drama, on tragedy, is that we think that the drama is happening up on stage, but that is not the true drama. The true drama is what's happening in the audience. The play is like a mirror, Aristotle will say, and of course, Shakespeare will play the same game in the play Hamlet, won't he? Where the audience looks into the mirror and sees reflected back themselves. With the fall of the protagonist for Aristotle, the audience will enjoy again that catharsis, that release of powerful emotions, namely to fear and pity. This play will elicit both in spades. In fact, some of you will say that at the end of this play, this is the most disturbing of any text you've ever, ever heard about. But it does elicit both of those things, fear and pity. And it certainly did in the audience of the Greeks. We have the third uh, Bacchae, um, third uh, choral lyric, um, and again, they come back and say the same thing all over again. You disrupt, you disrespect the gods, you will get jacked. And they say...